Hello, this is Ryan Lohner, and you might remember me from the Revisionist Almanac's recent episode, Let's Get Spooky. You probably also noticed that my entry there was easily the shortest, because I just listed the titles of my ten favorite movies without giving any explanation of them like just about everyone else did. It simply didn't occur to me that I could do that, and after listening to all this great stuff from everyone else, I figured I should go a bit deeper into why I named these ten as my favorite horror movies, so here we go. He Who Gets Slapped I love revenge stories in general, and this is one of the all-time great ones. It has Lon Chaney as a scientist who has all his work stolen and gets reduced to being a circus clown where he spends years planning out a brutal way to get back at everyone. It's got some impressively big scenes for the time with the circus acts, and you can see some real steps forward in movie direction here with the way it builds up the suspense, and it's all held together by Lon Chaney giving probably his best true performance outside his usual makeup act. It's also the first movie to use the MGM lot and if anyone cares about that. Murders in the Zoo There were a precious few years when movies could basically do whatever they wanted before the Hays Code came along to ruin everyone's fun, and this is maybe the single darkest and nastiest movie to come out of that pre-code period. The way I like to describe it is the opening scene is like something out of Saw, and it just builds from there. It has Lionel Atwill as a completely evil guy who is also murderously jealous of anyone he thinks is even looking at his wife, and the ways he comes up with to deal with them are so gruesome that movies today would hesitate to put them on screen. If you think you can handle it, definitely check this one out. The Spiral Staircase it's a common saying that if you want to understand a major trend in horror movies, look at what was going on in the real world a year or two before. And in this case, in 1945, you had the end of World War II, and along with it, the discovery of the Holocaust. And a year later comes this movie about a serial killer who is obsessed with ridding the world of anyone he considers quote-unquote imperfect. It's also a surprisingly feminist movie for the time, and you really get invested in the mute woman who's trying to get away from this guy however she can. This same year, the director also did The Killers with Burt Lancaster, which was one of the very few Ernest Hemingway adaptations he actually liked. And I have no idea how he had both of these in him, but here we are. The Haunting this was made by Robert Wise right after West Side Story, and he even brought Russ Tamblin along with him. So it's the same effect as Kubrick doing The Shining, where we get to see this master film craftsman turn his attention to just trying to scare the hell out of you, and it turns out he's really good at it. The angles and pans and zooms Wise is able to do here with the camera technology of the 60s is just insane, and it's also a real masterwork in how scary a movie can be without ever showing you what you're supposed to be scared of. It's all left entirely entirely to our imagination, and if you want to see how badly the other way could have gone, just watch Jan de Bont's remake. Theater of Blood It's Vincent Price playing a hammy actor who kills a bunch of snobby elitist critics while reciting Shakespeare. And if that doesn't get you interested, then I just can't relate to you about anything. There's also Diana Rigg in a fairly obvious twist role, which is still a lot of fun. And of course, the more you know Shakespeare, the more you'll get out of it, but the movie does a great job of keeping you in the loop even if you know nothing. A bunch of big, highbrow British actors just kicking back and having a blast getting messily killed. What more could you want? Suspiria Italian giallo movies tend to be really stylized, with very deliberate use of color and going more for the much-dreaded emotional truth rather than logical sense. And this movie is maybe the absolute purest expression of that. The set design is incredible, always making you feel like this is its own special world where everything's just slightly off, but it still makes its own kind of sense. The music by Goblin is pretty great too, some of their best work. If you haven't seen any Dario Argento, this may be one you want to build to a bit, but when you get there, it's worth it. The Thing. I actually consider this movie kind of a companion piece with another horror remake from a few years later, The Fly. They're both about people mutating into horrible alien monsters brought to life by some of the greatest practical effects in movie history. But I definitely call this one the better experience, with the setup of a shape-shifting alien exploited perfectly by John Carpenter through the whole thing. And as a bonus, the setup also means that there's never a moment where someone has to be completely stupid just so the movie doesn't end early, and how often do you see that? Black Swan. For years, I called this the scariest movie I'd ever seen. Darren Aronofsky's movies tend to be scary even when he's just doing straight drama, so when he's actually trying to be scary, you've got an experience that won't leave your head anytime soon. How much is real or just in the main character's mind? Who cares when you've got Natalie Portman fully earning her Oscar and surrounded by so much mind-screwy goodness? I really liked Mother, too, but this still beats it out. The Lighthouse. 
This is the movie that I now call the scariest I've ever seen. Robert Eggers follows up The Witch with 90 minutes of two amazing actors trying to out-ham each other plus a ton of fart jokes, and somehow the underlying terror of the situation is always there in the back of your mind, never becoming quite clear but still not in a way that makes you feel cheated at all. The point here is to never get a clear idea of what's going on and everyone you talk to will likely have a take that's a bit different from any other. When a movie can pull that off when it's actually trying to, it's something special. Orphan First Kill I was not a fan of the first Orphan. It's way too long, it completely runs out of ideas halfway through and has to keep repeating itself, and the big twist is just weird in a bad way. So a prequel seemed like it could never work, especially with 26-year-old Isabel Furman meant to be a character she'd last played at 12 at a year younger. But somehow it actually does work, and they find a much better way to use the first movie's basic setup that constantly keeps you guessing and makes you want to immediately watch the movie again to spot the clues you missed. This was a big reminder to never count a movie out before you've seen it. So there you have it. As Gary Larson put it, I don't know how interesting any of this was, but now it's in your brain cell, so you're stuck with it. It was certainly a lot of fun for me, after I'd never really put much thought into my top 10 horror movies and I had to think long and hard about what would go on the list and why. Hope to see all you movie fans again soon.